This video has been sponsored by Nvidia and Scan. So you guys have been asking me to make a cyberpunk themed video for over a year now. Since Cyberpunk 2077 was just released, I thought it was a great time to finally give you the video you've all been asking for. Instead of doing something really boring and generic like a city skyline, I thought we'd do something a little bit more challenging today, so we're going to make a cyberpunk themed character in Blender. This entire video has been made on an Aero 15 laptop by Gigabyte, that's part of Nvidia Studio lineup. Nvidia Studio is an initiative where Nvidia works directly with device manufacturers to make computers that are certified to have really great performance in creative apps like Blender. You can see Scan's whole range of Nvidia Studio devices by following the link in the description. So I start off this project like I always do just by grabbing a few reference images. Once those were in place and I had some sort of concept in mind, I knew that I'd need a base mesh. I used the Make Human program for this. If you've seen my videos before, you've likely seen me talk about this program already. But it's basically a free tool that you can use to quickly generate simple base meshes. You just use a slider system to control the body proportions. I took that character over to Blender once I was happy with it and I started sculpting on top of the base mesh. It's worth mentioning that I have only ever done one character sculpt in Blender before, so I'm basically figuring out this whole workflow as I go, it isn't necessarily the best way to go about things. I knew that I wanted to try and keep the topology of the character intact because that would make things easier later down the line. So instead of using dynamic topology which would ruin the mesh, I used the multi-res modifier. If you have a really slow computer, the multi-res might not be the best way to go about it, but this laptop had no problem sculpting on high resolution meshes. The good thing about the multi-res modifier is that it tends to be much more responsive in the viewport anyway compared to using the subsurf modifier. If you've never used multi-res before, it's basically like a layer system for subdivision. You can subdivide the mesh and add fine details, but it doesn't affect the low resolution base mesh. So you can see here that I'm just playing around with the eye digger. I didn't really have any concept sketches or anything done for this, so I'm basically just making up the design as I go. I thought about giving her some sort of nose ring at one point, but I changed my mind about that. I quickly set up a HDR image as the background here, and I just placed a few simple lights to try and block out the composition. I don't have a lot of tips for sculpting faces other than to make small changes at a time. Just keep comparing the character that you're working on to reference photos to make sure that the anatomy looks good. Don't get discouraged if the character starts to look a little bit horrendous. You're probably going to hit a wall at several points where you're going to look at it and be like, oh, this looks terrible. But if you just keep pushing on, eventually it should start to look okay. So at this point, I decided to start rigging the character, which isn't a process that I particularly enjoy. But halfway through the rigging process, I remembered that I'm actually a lazy person and there's a free tool that can do it all for me called Adobe Mixamo. So I just went under the Adobe site and I used that instead. Unfortunately, the high resolution version of the character wouldn't import into Mixamo, so I had to lose some of the high level details from the multi-res modifier. Luckily, I hadn't really added any details anyway, so it wasn't a big deal. So in Mixamo, you just have to align some points onto your mesh and then it'll automatically generate the rig for you, which you can then download straight into Blender and you're good to go. I found an animation on the Mixamo website that was pretty similar to the final pose that I knew that I wanted, so I could just easily import that as well into Blender. I made a few little tweaks to the pose in Blender and then I deleted all of the keyframes apart from the one keyframe for that specific frame. I jumped back to the first frame and I used Alt and R in pause mode which resets all of the keyframes back to the default pause. That gave me this animation that goes from the T pause on the first frame to the final pause. I knew that would make it easier later on when I wanted to add some clothing. Normally I would make something like clothing just in Blender, but I've had this trial version of a program called Marvelous Designer downloaded for ages and I've been meaning to really try it out. Everything that I did in Marvelous Designer can be done in Blender for free, I'll link some relevant tutorials in the description about making clothes, but I just wanted to try this program out. Making clothes in Marvelous works a lot like making clothes in real life. You draw out the patterns for the different cuts of cloth and then you stitch them together based down the seams. One of the best things about Marvelous is that it has a really lightning fast real-time cloth simulator. 
I didn't realize that you can also use a GPU accelerated version of it, which apparently works even faster. I just used the CPU one, but it was still really fast. So I gave her this little crop top and I was planning on giving her jeans or leggings at one point or yoga pants, but I changed my mind about that and I thought a PVC style skirt would look really good. Once the high quality simulation was complete in Marvelous Designer, I exported the clothes and put them back in the blender. The skirt had some really bad topology, I assume that's probably my fault to be honest, I think I messed up some settings along the way, but it doesn't matter, because instead of making the whole skirt again in Marvelous Designer, I could just quickly re-topologize it in Blender. I basically just added a cylinder and I got rid of the top and the bottom faces, then I applied a shrink wrap modifier to it. If you select the skirt geometry then, what the shrink wrap modifier does is it basically adheres it to the shape, kind of like shrink wrapping plastic, it moulds itself to the shape of whatever it's attached to. It was a little bit fiddly to get it right, but I did end up with some nice clean topology that I could then easily sculpt on top of just by adding a subdivision surface modifier. For a t-shirt I added a normal map which gave me the look of some fine details from fabric just like you would get on a normal piece of cloth. I also quickly made this logo in Photoshop and I used the alpha of that texture as the factor of a mix node to mix two principal shaders together. That way I could give the logo a different material and a different colour to the rest of the t-shirt. I gave the logo just a little bit of bump with the noise node and that kind of made it look like it was screen printed on top of the fabric. I thought it would look really cool to give this character some sort of choker so I imported this heart shape image into Blender and I used the path curve just to trace around the outline. Then in the curve properties I just added a little bit of thickness and I got this nice heart shape. The band for the choker was just another cylinder and I deleted the top and the bottom faces just like I did with retopologizing the skirt and then I used that shrink wrap modifier again so it would wrap itself around the shape of the neck. Then just a little bit of proportional editing was used to kind of wrap the edges around the heart shape to make it look kind of like it was all attached. I also added a solidify modifier to it just to give it a little bit of thickness. I played around with a metal shader for the heart at first, but I thought it would look even more cyberpunk if it was actually lit up, so I used an emission shader. I wanted to make the band look like it was a semi-see-through plastic. Sometimes transmissive materials in Blender look really dark. You could fix that dark issue by going into the principal node and changing the setting at the very top. It's something no one ever does, I think. But if you change from GGX to multi-scatter, you lose a lot less light inside the material. It does render a little bit slower if you use multi-scatter, but this is such a small part of the render it's really not going to make a difference. I did a bit more sculpting of some details on the character at this point. I didn't bother recording this bit because it's just more of the same stuff I was doing earlier on, just making little changes at a time compared to some reference photos. I also altered the default texture that came out of Make Human in Photoshop. I just got a few different photographs of some faces and I basically just photoshopped them on top. So I got like a, a nose that looked good and a pair of lips and I photoshopped those straight on top of the original texture. So this is the final skin shader that I used. There's a normal map which just adds some pores under the skin, adds some wrinkles as well and a few lines on the lips. Next there's a roughness map that I made in Photoshop. It basically just adds a little bit of glossiness to the lipstick. There's a specular map where the lighter colours are more reflective and it adds a little bit of shine onto areas of the face like the nose and the ears. There's also this subsurface scattering layer and that's just a modified version of the main texture and I just painted on some highlights using the dodge brush in Photoshop around areas like the lips where more light would pass through. Finally of course there's the main texture that I showed you earlier. When you put that all together you get a pretty nice realistic looking skin. I've found that making realistic skin shaders is one of the hardest parts of the whole character process. Part of the problem is that you have to make lots of little fine adjustments to the values in order to get everything to look right, otherwise the character tends to look really artificial and plasticky. That's where Nvidia's Optics API came in really handy. Nvidia's Studio program isn't just about making better hardware and computers, they've also worked on software tools like Optics, which works directly to enhance programs like Blender. 
with the optics denoising enabled in the viewport, I was able to make all these really small adjustments to the skin texture and I could see the results basically in real time without having to make loads of different test renders. Once I found something that I thought looked good, I just used Ctrl and B to create a render box around the area, then I quickly just rendered out a sample to see how that would look in the final render. In the past I would have had to use my CPU for this which would have took a really long time, but with optics rendering enabled, I was able to leverage the power of the whole GPU using the RT cores which are dedicated to ray tracing and they're really fast. To create the character's hair, I basically just traced around half of the scalp, and then in the select menu there's an option to select the inner region that you've drawn out with the select tool. I duplicate those faces and separate them into their own selection, then I slapped a mirror modifier on it to give me the other side of the scalp. Then I just scaled it down slightly so the scalp thing was kind of inside the head just a little bit. Since I copied this object from the main character, it's still attached to the armature and it moves with the rest of the head when the animation plays. So onto that scalp object I applied a hair particle system. I tried to be lazy here and use the hair dynamics to just simulate a quick hairstyle, but unfortunately she came out looking like David Bowie in Labyrinth, so that wasn't going to work. I had to bite the bullet instead and style the hair manually. If you go into Blender's particle edit mode, you can manually place down where hairs are going to appear. If you use the child particle settings, for each time you place down a strand of hair, it'll add a larger clump of hairs around it. I found that the simple particle hair system works better for the children instead of the interpolated mode, but what you have to do is reduce down the radius that the particles will appear around the main hair. Otherwise, everything just gets covered in hair and it looks a little bit rubbish. I'm not going to lie, it took many, many attempts to give this girl a decent hairstyle. No matter what I did, she kept coming out looking like that dude from the end of The Last Crusade. Since I had to go through this horrible process though, I'm going to make you go through it with me too. We're going to watch this whole thing in time lapse. But while we watch this, I would just like to mention that that guy from The Last Crusade is the same actor who played Pycel in Game of Thrones. Anyway, eventually I got a hairstyle that was working for me and I started on the hair material. I used the principal hair shader for this with a low roughness value a high radial roughness value and a little bit of the coat setting. I used a colour ramp to define the shading of the hair. I wanted the hair to kind of be pink but with areas that are bleached showing through, especially on the roots. I used the hair info node to achieve that look. It has this value setting called interpret. That gives you basically a gradient that goes down the length of the hair. There's also a random output per strand that can give you a different colour for each strand of hair. So I mixed those together with a multiply node, then I also mixed in another noise texture with a multiply node, and that gave me the exact sort of hairstyle that I was looking for. So I tried making eyebrows for the character with the same method that I made the hair, just by copying some of the base mesh and then applying a hair particle system to it, but that didn't work, it looked rubbish. So then I tried a vertex weight painting method and that also looked a bit crap. So eventually what I did is I traced out the shape of some eyebrows from the reference image and then I used the shrink wrap modifier again to adhere it to the shape of the character. I placed that just below the surface of the face and then I applied the hair particle system to that mesh. I got the eyebrow mesh to follow the animated character by making it a child of constraint attached to the head bone. I also made some quick eyelashes for the character, I just copied part of the mesh around the eye and I separated that out into its own mesh and then added a hair particle system to it. I turned up the clump value so it would kind of make the hairs look like they're sticking together a little bit and I just groomed the hairs into shape basically with the groom brush. Okay so to finally finish off this character I just added a small plane behind her and I used the quick smoke effect which you can find in the mesh settings at the top of the viewport. I turned up the noise setting on the smoke which would give me some nice turbulence in there and make it look a little bit less clean. For a final touch to the render I just added a circle mesh in and I extruded in slightly so it would have a little bit of thickness. I slapped an emission shader on that with a nice colour turret and I placed it just behind the smoke. Unfortunately volumetrics take a really long time to render out in cycles and since I was planning on making this a very high resolution image I didn't want to wait forever just to render out the smoke. 
but since it was going to be blurred out in the background anyway because the camera's depth had failed, I knew I could get away with rendering the background at a lower resolution. So I rendered the background out separately, and then I just blew it up later on in compositing to a bigger size. I rendered out a second pass which was just the character on a transparent background. If you use the easy HDRI add-on, you can make the background transparent just by pressing this little icon that's in the options. I used Nvidia's Optics Denoiser for the final render which saved me an absolute bunch of time because the final render for this was over 6K resolution and that would have took lots and lots of samples to look noise free without the denoiser. So after compositing everything together in Photoshop I got a final image that looks something like this. I was really happy with how this final scene came out and I'm glad I spent all that extra time on the small details. This Aero 15 laptop that I used to create the render has an awesome 4K display, so it was nice to be able to see all those little extra details that I've spent so much time on. Not to mention, the colour accuracy is much better than the desktop monitor that I typically use for work. Thank you to Nvidia and Scan for making this video possible. Remember to check out the link in the description to see Scan's range of Nvidia powered studio devices. I'll be back with the third and final part of this series very shortly, I've got something really exciting planned for that one. Remember to hit the like and subscribe button if you haven't already, and I'll catch you guys in a few days with another video.